my heart beats for Jesus. And I know that the heart of Jesus beats for the church. It beats for you and me. And that's why we're doing this series of studies on Jesus wants his church back. Jesus wants to give the full blessing to his church, to his people, that we might be filled with all the fullness and all the benefits that his work on the cross and his resurrection have achieved. He wants us to experience the full restoration of his power and his glory, his perfection, his righteousness, his love and his glory. He loves us so much, he has made us to be co-heirs with him. So in this series of studies on Jesus wants his church back, Paul, what sort of church does Jesus want? Well, in this ninth study in the series, we want to look at the New Testament church pattern. How did the New Testament church develop? How was the pattern established in the church? So here now in number nine, in studying the New Testament church pattern, we want you to understand the fullness of the power of the glory that God has for you. We'll begin by looking uh, in Acts chapter 17 and seeing what was laid down in the early part of the church as the testimony of what the church was like that was walking in the pattern that Jesus had established. Acts chapter 17, beginning with verse 1. They came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as was his custom, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. But the Jews were not persuaded gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. They dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down. Do you notice what their testimony was? These are the men who turned the world upside down. In fact, the destiny of nations were being changed by the power of the gospel. What? Change a nation's destiny? Are you kidding? You know, a young man by the name of Mark in one of my seminars, he, he challenged me and said, this is impossible, it's the impossible dream. And I said to him, well, Mark, I agree it is impossible. But our Jesus, he's a specialist when it comes to impossibilities. Yes, God wants a dynamic living church, walking in the, the, the pattern uh, that he has laid down in his word that will change the destiny of nations. Look at the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17, uh, beginning in verse 21, but going down to verse 23. Jesus prayed, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And Jesus continued to pray, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. See, when Jesus prayed, he was praying that the quality of the unity between the Father and the Son would be manifest in the church that we would have that same quality of unity, absolute, perfect unity. And this would be that great miracle that would convince the world. Our divisions at the moment cause many people to stumble. They see that the flesh within the church, they see 
uh, the pride, they see the ambition, they see uh, the, the fighting one against another. But Jesus prayed that we might be one so that the world might believe. You know, the promise of all nations being blessed and transformed by the gospel. First of it was, you know, given to Abraham. We know it was given to Abraham because in the Abrahamic covenant, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 to 3, we read, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing and I will bless those that bless you and curse those who curses you. And in you shall all the nations or all the families of the earth be blessed. This covenant promise was also given to Isaac. And we read in Genesis chapter 22, verses 17 to 18. Your seed shall possess the gate or the cities of his enemies. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The promise was also made to Jacob in Genesis 28, 13 to 14. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. Your seed shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We also have the promise of Psalm 2 and verse 8. It was a prayer. And the Lord was calling upon us to pray. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Have you asked the Lord for your city? You know, for Ringwood, you know, here in Melbourne, Australia? For Victoria, for Australia? What about Indonesia? What about China? What about the other countries? You know, have you asked the Lord for your inheritance? If not, why not? Do you really believe the promises of, of God's word? We see in the New Testament, those promises in the Old Testament are confirmed to us in Galatians 3 and verse 8. And the scripture foreseen that God would justify the nations through faith, preach the gospel before to Abraham. The gospel, good news. Preach it to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. Galatians 3, 13 to 14, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law so that the blessing of Abraham might be to the nations in Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 29, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We can claim those promises that we can be a blessing to the nations. We can see nations being changed and transformed by the power of God. This is the sort of church that Jesus wants. A church with the power, by the power of the gospel, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, to change the destiny of nations. Now, there's three principles for us getting to know the will of God. The first of these three major principles is the shepherd-sheep principle. The sheep hear his voice. And in John 10 and verse 4, it says, He goes before them and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The second principle is the living sacrifice and altar principle of laying down our lives so that we can be changed by his power. Are we willing to lay it down on his altar that he might change and transform us into the image of Christ? Paul said to the Romans in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable and perfect will of God. We can know the will of God. If we lay down our lives upon that altar, allow him to process us, he can change and transform our way of thinking that we might understand his perfect will. Isn't that what Jesus also meant when he said that I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit and he will lead and guide you into all truth? Thirdly, to know the will of God, we have the confirmation principle. 
We don't just believe anything that just comes once. The Bible has a principle that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. That's recorded in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 1. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So it's not a surprise that when we come to the establishing of the gospel outreach and the pattern of God in the New Testament churches, that there were three centers of evangelism and outreach. I mean, there were many churches and each of those churches were dynamic witnesses, but there were three major centers where we see the propagation and the development um, of the gospel as it went out to the nations of the world. These three great centers were Jerusalem, Antioch, and Ephesus. Now, in Jerusalem, the first of these ones, we see in Acts 1.15, it began with 120 believers. Acts 2.41, 3,000 new believers. In Acts 2.47, they increased every day. In Acts 4 and verse 4, 5,000 men were saved. In Acts 5.14, they grew all the more. In Acts 6, 7, many priests came to faith in Christ. Well, what was then happening in Antioch? Well, Antioch was the center of missionary endeavor, of going out to the nations of the world. It was where the three apostolic journeys of Paul had their origins. Also, the two apostolic journeys of Barnabas. From Antioch, heathen nations were being reached. And in Acts 12, 27, the testimony was that they grew all the more. When we come to the third center, Ephesus, we have uh, many testimonies, amazing testimonies uh, in history about this church. Betty Radis, uh, the editor of the early Christian writings on page 74, said, Ephesus was the capital of Asia, the richest province in the Roman Empire. Wow, it was a a mighty city. I've been there. I've seen the ruins. It's an awesome place. But it was also the capital for the religion of Artemis. Thus, as Ramsey says in his book, St. Paul, the superstition of all Asia was concentrated in Ephesus. See the statue of Artemis and the crescent moon as a necklace around her throat. But this city was a city that Paul and then later John challenged with the gospel of Christ. And it had a, an enormous reputation. Again, Betty Radis uh, informs us, the church at Ephesus, according to Ignatius, Ignatius, one of the early church fathers, was famous as a nursery of saints and martyrs. Not surprising because in Acts 19, uh, we read in nine and verses 9 and 10, that in the space of two years, they reached every man, woman and child with the gospel in the province of Asia Minor. Ramsey also uh, reports, Ignatius desired to be found in the company of the Christians of Ephesus. Uh, John Stott, a famous uh, theologian, said, in all three worlds, the free world, the communist world and the third world, we need to be asking radical questions about the church. And Ephesians will supply us with answers. For here is Christ's own specification, his pattern, his model of his church. Now, the growth of the church in Ephesus was quite amazing. In Acts 19 and verse 7, it began with 12 people. In Acts 19.10, we find that after two years, all Asia is evangelized. Acts 19.19, it says, many believed. Now, notice in this diagram, a photo I took when I was there, in the foreground, we have the site of the Temple of Artemis. Uh, behind it uh, is the current mosque, and behind it, the Roman uh, castle or, or Paul's prison. And then a little bit to the right, we see uh, the ruins of the Church of St. John. It's quite an amazing uh, complex. But it's also a story of tragedy because after the victory of the gospel in this place, we find that the spirit of Artemis first moved over into the church at the Council of Ephesus where Mary was given Artemis' title um, as being the Queen of Heaven. 
and they put the uh, crescent moon around her head as a halo. Later on, after Turkey was overrun by Islam, we find that the crescent moon, you could say the spirit of Artemis, moved over to the mosque. Anyway, after the time of Paul and then the time uh, of John, after his release from prison, um, we find that an amazing event took place. This amazing event is recorded in, in history. Not in the Bible. This is after the finish of the New Testament writings. But the Apostle John was still alive. And we have the recording in uh, the book, The Christianizing of the Roman Empire, AD 100 to AD uh, 400 by Ramsey McMullen. And he researched, and this is what he discovered. Even more effective in the temple of Artemis itself, he, John, prayed, O oh God, at whose name every idol and every demon and unclean power flees, now let the demon in this place run from your name. And as John said this, suddenly the altar of Artemis burst into many small pieces, and half the temple collapsed. The Ephesians who were present began crying out with a loud voice, There is only one God, the God of John. We repent, because now we have seen your mighty power. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your will, and save us from our great errors. And many of them fell with their faces to the ground and prayed, pleading. Others kneeled and prayed. Some ripped their clothes and wept, while others tried to flee. Ephesus had become a Christian city. The religion of Artemis had been defeated. And when we look at the growth of God's word through these three major centers um, of the gospel expansion, we see that in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, it says the word of God grew. At Antioch, in Acts 12, 24, it says the word of God grew and multiplied. And concerning Ephesus in Acts 19, 20, it says the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Well, there's more said about Ephesus and the ministry in Asia Minor than any other part of the New Testament church. New Testament and Asia Minor, so many scriptures concerning this place. You can see it in Acts 16, uh, Acts 18 to 20, 1 Corinthians 15, 26 to 32, 1 Corinthians 16, 6 to 12, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 to 11, the epistle to the Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, 1st, 2nd and 3rd epistles of John, and the book of Revelation. This was a major part of the revelation of the whole New Testament pattern for establishing the New Testament church. Now, why was there such explosive growth in these three centres in the New Testament church? Well, first of all, in Jerusalem, there was the power of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 uh, were saved and baptised. There was also anointed apostolic ministry preaching the gospel um, to the Jews. And at Antioch, we read that there was great persecution, but there was deliverance from death and judgment. There was apostolic, prophetic and teacher ministries who were spreading the gospel to the unreached nations. At Ephesus, there was triumphant spiritual warfare. Acts 19, Ephesians 6, there were five ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers to equip believers to spread the gospel to the nations. As we read in Ephesians 4, um, 11 to 13 and verse 16 and chapter 5, 16. There was also discipleship and mission training in Acts 19, 9 to 10. Also see Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 13 to 14, 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 2 Timothy 4, 2 to 7. There was a multi-generation Paul said to Timothy, as I've taught you, you teach others who are also able to teach others. There had to be a multi-generation uh, of people teaching the power of the gospel, living the life of Christ, so that we might see the nations be enriched. We also read that there were apostolic keys being revealed. Those three journeys, amazing three journeys, opened up 
three doors. In Antioch, it was the door of faith. In Acts 14, 27, uh, you can see it in the, in the Greek here, but see in the blue there, Thuran Pistios, a door of faith. Secondly, at Troas, a door of the gospel was opened. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 12. In Thuras Moi and Neogmanes, in the in the in the pink there, a, a door was opened to me in the Lord. And thirdly, at Ephesus, it was a great and effective door. And this is referred to in 1 Corinthians 16, 8 to 9. See in the yellow there. Thura Megale Kai in It was a great door, an energetic, effective, powerful door of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the time will come when the door will be closed. Just as with Noah's ark in Luke 17, 26, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. You see, there was a time when the door would close. And it's the same in the last days. We're in the age of grace, but the time will come when the door will be closed. How much time do we have left? Well, it's now 1,991 years since the cross of Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're in the year 2021, um, approximately. Um, and the birth of the church it was around 30 AD. So that's 1,991 years ago. So another nine years we'll be celebrating uh, the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church. Is it possible there's been mistakes in the calculations in the history of the world? Absolutely, it's possible. We know that they got the, uh, the birth date of Christ wrong. Some say it was 4 BC, some say 6, some even say 8 BC. And that's because they found mistakes in the calculations in history. So there's possibly mistakes, other mistakes um, in the calculation in history. But anyway, time is in God's hand. And when Jesus returns, it will come at the Father's pleasure, when the Father is ready and everything has been fulfilled. But looking at the New Testament church, what were the keys to their success? Well, firstly, they walked by faith. They had an international reputation for their faith. We can read that in Ephesians and Romans and Acts. In Ephesians 1.15, it says, this is about the Ephesian church. I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. So in Mark 9, 23, Jesus said everything is possible for the person who believes. Secondly, the church at Ephesus was motivated by love. In Ephesians 1, 15, their testimony of love was known in all the world. They had first love. First love for what? For Jesus, the word, the church, the leadership and the lust. In 1 John 4.18, uh, John said, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts cast out all fear. Now, we all know John 3.16, but what about 1 John 3.16? This is what it says. It says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brothers. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Everyone hating his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has everlasting life abiding in him. By this we have known the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. Now, notice what's here in the yellow. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Now, the testimony of Ignatius. You see... The Roman church wanted to deliver him from the cruel death of being ripped to pieces by the lions in the Colosseum uh, in Rome. And they were getting a petition together to try to save him, to spare his life. But Ignatius wrote to them and said to them, Do not become an ally of Satan and deny me the martyr's crown. I look forward to the day when they take me into the arena and release me among the, the lions. And the lions come and they rip the flesh off my bones and they take my bones into their mouths and crush them until there is nothing left of Ignatius save Jesus Christ. This testimony was a great inspiration to the church of that time and was one of the reasons that motivated many, many believers 
to boldly proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, even in the face of the cruelest of deaths. Jesus taught his disciples about love. And in John 13, 34 to 35, he said, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. How will people know that we are the true disciples of Christ? It's because we love one another. We lay down our lives one for another. We lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. But what do they see today? They see division, competition, slander one against another. But Jesus prayed, Father, that they might be one so that the world might believe. Annette and I served for many years in Sulawesi. But I can remember back in 1974, it was early December, I went to Tentena in central Sulawesi, Indonesia, for the very first time. And I heard a tragic testimony because that day the military commander had committed suicide. He committed suicide because his wife, uh, he and his wife had come from Java and they were Muslims, but his wife had become a Christian. And so this military commander wanted to know why become a believer in Jesus? Why become a Christian? So he went to one church and he said to them, how do I become a Christian? And they explained to him, according to that church's rules and regulations, how a person could become a Christian. But he concluded by saying, down the end of the street, there's another church. What about them? And the pastor of his first church said, oh, don't go to them. They're a false uh, cult. They, they're not a true church. So the commander went down to that church. And he said to them, how do I become a Christian? And they explained how he needed to repent and believe in Jesus and, and that uh, by doing this, he would become a Christian. And he said, but what about the other church at the other end of town? And they said, oh, that's a dead church. Don't have anything to do with them. This man was devastated by the divisions in the church, by the animosity from one church to another, the division within the church. This increased his confusion and he ended up going home and committing suicide. This shook me. This was my first day in Tentena, Central Sulawesi, Indonesia. The divisions within the church are one of the greatest hindrances to the gospel. Jesus wants his church back. He wants a united church that has fallen in love with him, fallen in love with one another, fallen in love with the word of God, fallen in love with the lost. And we're willing to lay down everything so that the lost might be saved. The third thing about the Ephesian church is that they lived in heavenly places. In Ephesians 2, 6, it, it says, and has raised, this is Paul you know, speaking, and he says, and, and God has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We, God has given to us a special position of relationship with him and access to his power and to his glory. Now, what else do we find in Ephesus? Well, there's a number of important things. Firstly, they were complete in leadership and priesthood. We find they had the fivefold ministries, Ephesians 4.11. They had the priesthood of all believers. We see that in Ephesians 4.12-16, which we can compare with 1 Peter 2.9. Every member of the church had gifts and talents. Everyone was vital in the building up of the church. They also had spiritual and practical servant leadership as we see in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 13. And we can compare uh, with Acts 6, 1 to 7, with the appointment of the seven deacons in the early church. Secondly, the Ephesian church was complete doctrinally. In Acts 20 and verse 20, it says, I kept back nothing that was profitable, 
but have shown you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Verse 27, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Thirdly, the Ephesian church was complete in evangelism. In Ephesus, Paul had a great and effective door opened to him by the Lord, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 16, 8 to 9. It is here we have the example of a church that fulfilled the Great Commission within its country in the space of only two years. Oh, you might say, well, it's easier for them than for us. But no, they were in a time of great persecution. They were in a time when uh, Ephesus was the capital of the religion of Artemis. And yet it was there that the greatest breakthroughs were taking place. As it says in Acts 19 and verse 10, And this happened over two years, so that all, all, all those living in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Who preached the gospel to the whole of Asia in two years? It wasn't Paul. He was in the school of Tyrannus, training the new disciples. It was the every believer ministry. All believers have a role to play in the spreading of the gospel of Christ. In Acts 19 verses 9 to 10, we read that Paul took the disciples and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all those living in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. The testimony of this amazing evangelism is recorded in history. And the testimony of history is recorded by W. R. Ramsey. He testified that the evangelism in Asia spread most rapidly and affected the largest proportion of the whole population. F. F. Bruce describes the rate of evangelism as extraordinary. E. M. Blakelock says the results were momentous. Pliny, in the second century, he gives testimony that by the year AD 112, the growth and influence of the gospel had completely destroyed the religion of Artemis and the temples were almost deserted. That's the power of the gospel, to change the destiny of nations. Fourthly, the church in Ephesus was complete in persecution. <laughs> You're going to grow, then you might glow. Uh, you might have to face horrific persecution, but are we prepared to pay the price? Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. The Ephesian church was taught that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's not a threat. That's a promise. When we follow Christ fully, we will suffer persecution. Paul wrote that to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, and Timothy was in Ephesus. But this meant that uh, it meant a lot, it meant much to the Ephesian Christians. Um, for their church, like many others in the first century, was born in the face of persecution. They counted the cost. Have we? There were riots in Ephesus. The uproar at Ephesus is given great attention uh, by Luke in the book of Acts. The crowds had rushed into the great theater, which held some 25,000 people. I've been in there. It's an amazing auditorium. And there was great unity in their false worship. As it says in Acts 19.34, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. There were riots in Ephesus. Paul told the Corinthians about the persecution he experienced. I have fought with wild beasts at Ephesus. Furthermore, he said that at Ephesus, there are many adversaries. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 32 and 1 Corinthians 16, 8 to 9, we can see this. Another time he wrote to them saying, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia which we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 to 9. Now the Ephesian Jews, they caused riots all the way down to Jerusalem. In Acts 21, 27 to 36, uh, it says that even when Paul went to Jerusalem, the Ephesian Jews were there to persecute him 
and kill him if possible. And when the soldiers rescued him, the multitude cried out, Away with him! How similar to the cry of the crowd that crucified Christ. And we should expect riots too. If we're going to progress in the gospel, there could be trouble just around the corner. If the church is going to let God plant his pattern within, then Satan will be furious and bring persecution against it for the manifestation of the heavenly pattern in the church will bring about Satan's destruction, just as it did in Ephesus. Are you willing to face the consequences of a divine visitation? Are you willing to stir the pot and count the cost? Remember in Nahum chapter 1 and verse 3, the storms are the dust of his feet. Do you really want God to come walking into town and stirring up all of the dust? If persecution was to happen today, what would you do? What would happen if we really prayed? Matthew 6 and verse 10, Your kingdom come on earth just as it is in heaven. You know, fifthly, the church in Ephesus was complete in love. The Ephesians were taught to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, Ephesians 3.19. Now, notice a little slogan here, reading from the white, no Jesus, no love. But if there's no Jesus, there's no love. What went wrong? Well, true mission can only function on the basis of sacrificial love. The Ephesians once had the love for all the saints, as it says in Ephesians 1.15, and had what Jesus called first love, Revelation 2 and verse 4. But what happened? What happened? In Matthew 25.45, Jesus said, Inasmuch as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. How much do you love Jesus? Well, what's the answer? As much as you love the person who irritates you the most, that's how much you love Jesus. And the Ephesian church left its first love. Paul gave warning, particularly to the leaders, of two attacks coming against uh, the leadership of the church. Firstly, there were the external attacks coming from wolves, false uh, apostles, false prophets, false teachers, uh, as recorded in Acts 20, verses 28 to 29. Take heed to yourself. You've got to make sure you look after yourself. Make sure your relationship with God, your relationship with one another is right. We need to have love for Jesus. We have, need to have love for our fellow uh, leaders. We need to have love for the members of the church. We need to have love for the lost. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Secondly, there would be internal attacks. And this is where amongst the elders, leaving first love one to another, they would begin to fight for position, to try and go up that pyramid that uh, we looked at in the previous study. Acts 20, 30 to 31 says, Also men shall arise, arise, rising up from your own selves, from amongst the elders, speaking perverse things in order to draw disciples away from them. Therefore watch and remember for, for, for three years I did not cease to warn every night, day and night with tears. Paul was greatly moved. But later on, at the end of the century, after the Apostle John had returned to Ephesus from Patmos, a local church not far from Ephesus had a coup d'etat in the church. There'd been three elders in the church, Diotrephes, Gaius and Demetrius. But Diotrephes conducted a coup d'etat and we read in 3 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have preeminence among them, does not receive us. 
Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his, uh, <clears throat> his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. This is evidence of the departure from first love within the church. That's why in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, Jesus rebukes the Ephesians. I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear those who are evil and you tried those pretending to be apostles and are not. See, they, they were successful in the external attacks. They rejected the false uh, apostles. They rejected the wolves, but they lost when it came to first love and have found them liars, and you have borne and have patience, and for my name's sake you have laboured and have not fainted. I have against you that you left your first love. Therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do again the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent." You know, taking the candlestick. Uh, what did that really mean? Well, it, it meant a lot. You see this diagram of the candlestick. The seven-branched candlestick in its central column had 12 pieces. And on the left side, your three branches each had nine parts. You can read about this in uh, Exodus chapter 25. And on the right-hand side, there was also another three branches, each with nine parts. So you can count these parts, nine, 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 twelve, nine, nine, nine. The total is 66. So coming up on the left side to the central column, you have 39. That's Old Testament books. And then you have three by nine on the right-hand side, 27. That's New Testament books. And in Psalm 119, verse 105, it says, Your word is a light unto my path. So if the candlestick is taken away, then the revelation of God's word is lost. But also in that candlestick, you have nine parts in each of the branches, the three on the left and the three on the right. The number nine is the number of the work of the Holy Spirit. The central column has 12. That's the number of divine government. So if the candlestick is taken out, you lose the power of the Spirit of God and the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit. You lose the power of divine government. And what's more, if the candlestick is taken out, no light. And the church is left in darkness. Do we want to be left in darkness? Or do we want to see the church that Jesus wants? fully restored, that the light might shine, that the power of the gospel might live in our day and age. God bless you.